Well, all right. Good afternoon, officially, everyone. How you doing today? I have an assignment, and that is to put the bow on this morning, which is about the promise. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 7, and I'm going to look at verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James Bible because I grew up with King Jimmy. Now, it doesn't mean I don't like other versions. I like the message and living and all those other wonderful translation. But King Jimmy speaks to my heart. So I'm coming from the New King James Version. And it reads as such. It says, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as a god to Pharaoh. And Aaron, your brother, shall be a prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, they did so. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I just want to spend the next few minutes just reminding you, reminding, I should say, us as urban youth workers of the promise. See, God gave Moses a promise. He told Moses, he said, I'm going to deliver the children of Israel. And as a mother, when I make promises to my children, they're now grown, but even as grown children, they remind me of the promises that I make to them. In our house, we have what's called family meetings, and anyone can call that family meeting. When that family meeting is called, that means me mom gets to cook everybody's favorite dish. We sit around the table and we eat, and then towards the dessert time, we begin to discuss whatever issue is on the table. So one day, my oldest son, who's now 27, called a family meeting, and he said, Ma, we need a family meeting. I'm like, okay, what's up, what's up, what's up? They're not married, there are no girlfriends that I know of. I said, ooh, maybe there's a sister coming for me. Maybe there's a daughter-in-law coming for me. I go, oh, let's, okay, so, let's, so I fixed everybody's meal, we're at the table, and my son said, Ma, you made a promise. I was like, what, what you talking about, son? You made a promise to make sure that there would be a meal here when I came home. I was like, brother man, you are 27. <laughs> Hello. Here is the pot. Here is Mr. Stove. Here is Mrs. Microwave. Make yourself happy. <laughs> he reminded me of this promise. I said, all right, son, you're right, you're right. I'm, I'm going to do, do better. I'll work on it. We had been eating takeout for a season. And he said, Ma, I want you to keep this agreement that you made with us. I want you to keep it. Here God says to Moses, I have made an agreement with you that I'm going to lay my hand on Egypt and bring them and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses makes all the excuses. He says, but, 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 I can't do this, God. And God says, oh, no, you're going to do this. I, God, you, you see the way I speak. God says, all right, you got Aaron to speak, but you will go. You will do. You will function the way I've asked you to function. You will go in and become an agent of disruption. You will become the agent that's going to turn the land of Egypt right side up as you please. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and God reminds Moses, he says, Moses, this isn't going to be an easy task. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to let you go easily. In fact, some theologians say that that whole process of all of those 10 plagues took about 40 days or so, 40 days or so to complete so Moses hardens down, he buckles up his sleeves, and he says, okay, I'm in for the long haul. So Moses and Aaron, they go, they go to Egypt, and they say, God said, let 
my people go. And Pharaoh's like, that's good for your God. But as for these folk right here, they be mine. Y'all want to worship? You can worship here. Moses is like, God gave me a promise. And Pharaoh makes it hard. And he makes it hard. And he makes it hard. And so Moses says, okay, well, let me show you. Let me show you how good my God is. He takes his rod, throws it down. It becomes a serpent. The musicians go, ah, 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 ah. we got that. We got that darkness. We got that darkness. Serpent, we know serpents. They take their rods. They throw them down. They're serpents too. They know how to do that. Darkness knows how to imitate darkness. Because what? They're darkness. And Moses Moses is rod just sucks up all the other rods. That messes the musicians up just a little bit. But they continue to try to imitate. They get down to the third plague, which is the plague of lice. I don't know about you, but I. They get to the plague of lice, and the musicians think they can imitate. The magicians think they can imitate the lice, and they can't do it. And they turn, and they look, and they say, ah, that's the finger of God. Not the hand. God said to Moses, I'm going to bring the children of Israel out by my hand. And if that's just the finger, ooh, Mufasa, wait till the hand comes out. They can't imitate it. They can't do it. But it's still not enough. Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and God is beginning to lay out his hand. But the finger has come out. See, in my house, when my mother said, child, she was from Barbados. Any Caribbean folk in the house? Any Caribbean folk? From Barbados. When they say they're going to lay their hand on you, it's not a good thing. And in fact, a Bajan would say, you're going to come, child, they're going to give you some lashes. You're going to get some lashes to dare. And I'm, no, I don't want any lashes. That hand, that was something that we ran from. And in the Hebrew culture, when someone says, I'm going to lay my hand on you, it speaks of an oppression. It speaks of a heavy weight. It speaks of a pressing. And God was pressing Pharaoh. And he was pressing the land so that they would let his people go. He made Moses a promise. Somebody say promise. God has made us promises. And sometimes they take a while to come to pass. I know for me, I started out in college, and I have a twin sister and a younger sister, and my parents got divorced along that journey. And about my second to third year, entering into my third year, my mother announced, there is no more money for college. And she said, I'm also not signing those FAFSA forms, the financial aid forms. I'm not signing them. So y'all going to have to figure this out. Okay. I did what anybody else would do at that space. Withdrew from school and went and got a J-O-B so I could pay for M-E. And I started going back to school. And when I remember going to the admissions office or going to the office and to sign the papers to withdraw. And the Lord made me a promise at that moment. He said, you will finish. Okay, God. I signed the papers, left the office, tears coming down my face, went and got a job, kept working, kept working, but had that promise in the back of my mind that I'm going to go back to school and I will finish. Somebody say finish. But it was looking dark. The darkness had invaded my promise. I got married and had kids and kept working and I would go back to school and finally got back into school and things seemed to be going great. And then my mother died. So I had to probate her estate, put school on hold again. And I kept hearing that promise from God, I will finish. I felt like Moses who God said, you're going to deliver my people. You're going to bring them out of Egypt. You're going to bring them into a place. But it wasn't happening. 
So now we're still journeying with the children of Israel. They get down to plague number nine. Plague number nine is a plague of darkness. Darkness. God said, Moses, I want you to take your hand and I want you to stretch it towards the heaven. And when you stretch your hand towards the heaven, a great darkness is going to come and fall on the land. A thick darkness. But this is not the first time that God has moved in darkness. In fact, darkness from creation, from creation, when the darkness was on the earth, God, the Spirit of the Lord, moved and said, let there be light, and there was light. And darkness was like, ooh, got to go, peace, deuces. Darkness had to go. And that's not the only space in creation or the only space where darkness was used by God. In fact, as we continue further in Exodus chapter 20, as the children of Israel are finally delivered and they get to Mount Sinai, they get to the base of the mountain, and, they, and God says, Moses, Moses, I want to meet with you. And the people say to Moses, look, there's a thick darkness around that mountain. You go be with Jesus and God. You go do all that God thing. We're going to wait over here. When you're done talking to God, you come talk to us. But we don't want to go into that darkness because that's some spooky stuff that God's doing over there. And we're going to stay right over here. Then there was another darkness that the Bible talks about when Jesus, as he hung on the cross, before he gave up the ghost, there was a darkness that covered the land from the sixth hour till about the ninth hour. The darkness just came and fell over the land. And people had to stop and see la, pause for a moment. But this kind of darkness that's mentioned here in Exodus is not just that kind of darkness. It's a darkness, the scripture goes on to say, that could be seen and it could be felt. I equate that to like the heat. There are some parts of the country where you go into and it's hot. Like Texas, it's just hot. You open up the door and the heat just goes, bam, I'm here. And you just go, whoa, okay, okay. It's just hot. But then there's another kind of, of heat that has the humidity on it. That's the kind when you get out the shower and you think you're nice and dry, but within 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you just start to feel the beads of moisture on your body. You feel the heat. You feel it. This kind of darkness could be felt, the Bible says. Some of our situations, some of our young people, some of our communities are in darkness that can be felt. Have you ever been in a type of darkness that you could feel it? Have you ever been around someone that was so depressed you could feel, you felt their darkness for them? It's a heaviness that makes you go, oh. And God says, I'm going to bring my children out by this, this, this darkness. I'm going to bring them out. And in fact, as Egypt was so dark, they couldn't even see each other. It was so dark, they stayed in their homes for three days. But while Egypt was dark, the children of Israel had light. Isn't it like God to bring his children out of darkness into light? Isn't it like God to put light with the children of light? Isn't it like God to cause us to disrupt the darkness in such a way where we bring light even in the midst of a wicked and a dark place? There is light because of the people of God. There is light. God says to Moses, I'm going to bring my children out after the darkness. The promise is still there, even in the midst of the darkness. The promise is still alive and still doing well. So how do we know the promise of God? You say, all right, Virginia, how, how, do, you know, how do you know? I mean, how do you know that you know that you know that this promise is from God? And not something I just made up or not some, some fantasy that I just figured out and said, oh, I want that. That's, my, that's God's promise for me. It's not a naming and claiming. It's not a, I just want that thing because my neighbor got it. How do we know the promises of God? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I think there are three simple ways that you can discover if something is the promise. First of all, the promises of God are costly. Can you say costly? It's going to cost you something. We've all heard the statement, 
Salvation is free, but it ain't cheap. The promise that God gives you, I call it a this kind of promise. See, some of us, there are things that God is giving, uh, promising to us, and there are things that we want from God, but we have to be willing to pay the this kind of cost. See, I'm a shopper. I, I like going to, to the stores. I like, I like certain stores. I like my Marshalls, and I, I like the TJ Maxx, and I, 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 like, I like those stores. I, I, I like the Off Saks Fifth. You know, I like, the, I like the, the bargain shopping, bargain shopping, where you look at something, and, and as someone who has sewn, I used to sew back in the the day so I can look at a skirt and if it's an A-line skirt and just a simple zipper and less than a yard of material, I look at it and say, that don't cost $55. It's a straight skirt. Please. If I'm picking out a tie for my husband and my sons, I look at the tie. What's it made of? I don't care just about the label on it. What's the material? Is this thing going to pill and, and pick and look terrible in a, in a couple of weeks? No. And I look at it and I judge. The cost of that thing is what the tag is on it. Is it worth the cost? For some of us, the promises God have made to us, there's a cost attached to it. As Larry just talked about a few minutes ago, to go back to school is going to cost you. I haven't seen an Empire episode yet. I've been in a book for the past five years. I know who Cookie is, though. Okay. <laughs> But I haven't seen an Empire episode because I had to turn off the television. I had to turn down certain social media things so that I could focus and finish school. It costs me. It's a cost. Somebody say it's costly. The promises of God are going to cost you. Will you pay the price? It's a, this kind of promise. Jesus, when his disciples came one day and they said, oh, we couldn't cast this demon out. Jesus, I believe, was just kind of chilling and just said, you know what? Because that's a this kind, a demon. Jesus, what you mean? This kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. Are you going to pay the price? Are you going to pay the cost? Are you going to do the this kind? It's a this kind of promise, so it needs a this kind of cost. Somebody say costly. The promises of God aren't only just costly. The promises of God are creative. I love how Exodus, as you read through the plagues, every plague answered a question. Every plague answered something that was going on in Egypt. In fact, this particular plague of darkness was just crucial. God was just saying, I'm God. I'm just bad. He popped his collar. He was like, it's, it, it's over. The Egyptians worshipped the sun god. They put the sun as their high god. And by God covering the sun, the S-U-N, by God covering it, he said, I'm in charge. I got this. Your God is nothing. Try to make it shine. Three days. You can't even come out. You can pray. You can do all kind of stuff. You can pour your drink offerings. That God's not coming out. Because I made the sun. I bees like that. It's much how some people feel about us folk from New England as part of Brady Nation. Y'all don't have to show no love. It's all right. It's all right. I'm from New England. I'm a native Bostonian. We are proud of our Patriots, our Celtics, our Red Sox, and our Bruins. It's all right. 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 I'm good. I love your teams too. I just love mine more. It's like God being creative. The creative God says, look, I'm going to shut everything down. I'm going to shut it down. I'm going to use the very thing. I'm going to use the darkness to mess you up because he's so God. The promise God has given us, that promise will not be killed by darkness. In fact, the creative God is going to use whatever he needs to use to bring that promise to pass in your life, in the lives of the young people you're working with, in the communities that we serve. God says, my word stands true, and I will deliver. I will bring you out. I will do it, and I will do it my way because I am God, and there's nobody else quite like me. So the promises of God are first costly. The promises of God are next, creative. 
I love how watching how God helped me over these years to get this degree, to go through and finish, to go from the bachelor's into the Masters of Arts and Youth Ministry. And finally, this, this past May on Mother's Day weekend, my mentor, Dean Borgman of 10 years, crowned me, gave me my hood. I said, thank you, Jesus. Crossing that stage, the promise was fulfilled. But oh, it was creative, it was creative. I watched God move some people out the way and put other people in the way. He made a way, across that stage, no debt. I remember going to the bursar's office on the last day to say, please write on this paid in full because mama is done. D-O-N-E, stick the fork in, take it out, I'm done. God creatively worked it out to be able to pay for it. So for those of you that are saying, God, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. If he gives you a promise, Stand back and watch God be creative. Take your mental models off of it. Take your hands off of it and allow God to be creative and work it out in you. The promises of God are first what? Costly. It's going to cost you. Decide that you're going to pay the price. The promises of God are next what? Creative. God's going to do what he want to do, how he want to do when he want to do, cover them all. Thirdly, and lastly, the promises of God are clear. Somebody say clear. I love it when people come to me and they say, oh, Pastor Virginia, I am called by God. I have a call on my life. <laughs> yeah, and they come to me and they say, I, 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 I just, Jesus himself met me last week, and he told me that I'm called. No, I don't flinch. I just keep drinking my spot of tea and I just, yes, darling. So what is that call? And they start dancing all around the mulberry bush. They start backing up doing the running man and they're scraping the Milky Way. The call of God is clear. The promises of God are clear. It is specific. He said, Moses, I'm going to bring the children of Israel out by my hand. And when I'm done, everybody's going to know that I'm God. If there's a call on your life, God is clear. He's not going to scrape the Milky Way. He's not going to, I'm called to preach the gospel. Yeah, and so am I. And what are you? What is the thing? What is the specific promise that God is giving to you? And if you don't know, wait on him and ask others around you. How do you see my gifting? How do you see this working? It should be clear. Somebody say clear. No fog, no guessing game, no confusion, because God is not the author of confusion. I'm called to sing, but you can't carry a note in a bucket. Not it. <clears throat> Try again. I'm called to work with young people, but you can't stand young people. Young people don't like you. Uh, try again. <laughs> Be clear. Be clear. Crystal clear. When God said, I will finish, I said, okay, that's my promise. As I was getting closer and closer to the end, I was getting frustrated because it seemed like it wasn't going to happen. I said, okay, I'm going to talk to myself. God made this clear to me. All right, Lord, how can I do this? So I changed the password on my computer at work, and it was, I will finish. I will finish. Every day I got to my job, I typed in, I will finish. I've changed it so I can tell you my password now. I said, I will finish. And people would come in my office, what's wrong with you? Nothing. I will finish. <laughs> when the office would say, oh, we need another edit. That's okay. I will finish. <laughs> you have to be clear. Crystal clear for the promise that God has given you. Sometimes it's hard because those promises seem like they're unfulfilled. It took me 10 years to walk through that process of undergrad to bachelor's, or undergrad to grad to doctorate. And at times, because the hope was deferred, it was laid aside. My heart grew sick, but I had to trust in the promise. I will finish. Where are the promises of God for you that are deferred, that you might have given up on? Where are those promises? 
dust them off. Pick them back up. Do what you have to do to put it in front of you to remind you that God's promise of what he's going to do to disrupt the darkness in your life. Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's some of the kids you're ministering to in your communities. Maybe it's the neighborhood itself. But what is it that you need to do to remind yourself, God, you will do this thing that you said you're going to do in my life. And if you have to be like the old school song of the Clock Sisters, they had a song that says, if you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving. Keep moving towards that promise. Keep asking God to fulfill this. God, you gave me a promise, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to believe you, and I'm going to continue to press until you do what you said you were going to do. I signed up to be an agent to disrupt the darkness. What about you? Will you keep the promises God has said? Will you walk out those promises? If you don't mind, will you stand with me? I want us to agree in prayer together. And we're going to do it K-A-A, Kids Across America style. Make two fists. You know. Make two fists. Put your right fist over somebody else's left. Put your right fist over somebody else's left. The other right. The other right. If you're confused, it's the other right. Put your right fist over somebody else's left. Can you connect across the aisles, please? Connect. So everybody, your right fist over somebody else's left. There are promises all over this auditorium. There are promises that God has made to us. Some have been deferred. Some feel like broken promises. Some of you feel like Moses did. Pharaoh kept breaking the promise. He kept breaking the promises. And the reason why you need to be clear on what God is saying, the reason why you need to be, allow the Lord to be creative and you need to pay the cost is because the enemy of your soul will try to break the promise, say, look, God didn't do it. And the, the enemy of your soul will try to confuse you and say, no, 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 that's not the promise you want. Why don't you stay here, Moses, in worship? But Moses says, I can't worship here because if we sacrifice our animals here, it's an abomination to the Egyptians. We must go to the place God has called us to go. With your right hand, somebody is responsible for your promise. Dap them up, dap them up, come on, feel that. With your left hand, you're responsible for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is called dapping up. It's equal responsibility. You feel that? You feel that? You're feeling it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day and this time that you've called us together as urban youth workers. You are fighting for us. You are pushing back the darkness. You've made us promises, precious promises. You've given us promises in your word. Some, it's to complete their education. Some, it's that they're going to be healthy. Others, it's that they're going to find team members that can help them in youth ministry. For others, it's that the youth they're ministering to will live productive lives. God, we don't know what these promises are but you do. And Lord, today we're choosing to hold one another accountable. We're going to hold our brothers and sisters accountable. We're praying that every promise that you've spoken will come to pass. Father, we're now decreeing to the darkness that you will not keep us, that your darkness will not hold and hinder our promises from coming to pass. Father, right now we loose and we release your purposes over these youth workers today. And Father, we pray that from this moment on, we will set our faces as steel. We will set our faces as flint and we will accomplish that which you've asked us to do so that the promises of God, which are yea and amen, can be done in our lives. We bless you. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a clap. Offering the praise. God bless you.